In 2018, after we released the Giant Killer documentary, numerous people contacted us with more information on Flaherty, so much so that I felt compelled to write the book to try to fill in the missing pieces. Out of all the people that came forward, the person with the most intriguing information was a gentleman that we'll now refer to as Frank Sosa. We use this pseudonym to obviously protect his identity. Frank contacted us and told us that uh, he spent a lot of time with Flaherty in the 70s and 80s, and he wanted to clear up some things that he saw in the documentary. My dad tried to uh, get him on the phone many times, but he would only talk through emails. But eventually, my dad built a trust, and they eventually agreed to meet up for an interview. This interview you're about to hear is heavily edited for several reasons. One, uh, to protect obvious people, other people's identities. Two, I kind of felt there is some information that is still government sensitive that Frank gave out that I don't think is uh, proper to release. And the last thing is Frank just had a, a different way of telling a story. It was very non-linear. He would bounce up and back and it's just kind of hard to follow. And the last thing to note in this interview is Frank claimed that in the 70s and 80s, Richard would only answer to either the name Rick or Dick. So throughout most of the interview, he's calling uh, Flaherty Dick. He also refers to Flaherty as the dwarf or dwarf. And that had to do with an advertising gimmick Flaherty used to do as a salesman for Bushmaster rifles. He would make up pencils and coffee mugs with the name the dwarf that he would hand out to clients. The following is the interview. Let me, if I may, just get a couple of things. Did you serve in the military? No. no. Not, not in the American military. Okay, may I ask what, which military or we can't say? We can't say. It wasn't a military. It was a combat operations, but not in the military. Because of that. <laughs> okay, now that and, is... And being... South Florida, in the 70s. Hey, let me set this up for you real quick. First and foremost, okay? You say what you want about that. He was a patriot before anything else. We're in the gun shop, right? Uh, no. Uh, Rhodesia. And that's a word we haven't heard yet. We'll get to the Venezuela one. Okay, yeah, so I'm, okay. I'm, I'm working in a bookshop. I think I explained right. this right? Right. Norm, uh, Nor, Norm, Norm was a bastard of the highest repute. Okay, he's one of those guys. But he was a customer of mine in this bookshop, and he had a gun shop in Homestead at the time. Later on, he opened one in Davie, and that's the one I managed. And there was two from Miami. Ramon Dick, who I met through Dick, who was a mercenary in... Rhodesia, among other places in Africa, who had been a Vietnam vet, who ended up in Leavenworth for killing the people. His claim to fame was he would use an aluminum baseball bat with a plastic cover over it, which is how they used to come back then, and he beat you to death with it, drop the cover, take the bat with him, and throw it away some. Okay. And they finally caught up with him. He was doing it for, he would say, corporate assassination. Right. But it was various agencies from places around the world he had been. So you meet Dick. Actually, when, when we first started socializing was those big dinners he was doing in that cool rock house. But Before that, it was just Dick coming in the shop and right. we talk and go get a bagel and a coffee or something. It shows another dimension that he would, you know, befriend somebody. No, no. Dick's never befriended anybody in his life. Okay? Look. Dick was a little paranoid. Now, just because you're paranoid, that doesn't mean you don't have enemies. Okay? Yeah. And some of those enemies can be enemies that you self-made. Okay? Right. The, you said something, let me explain something to you. You said something to me on the phone that everybody looks at Dick in a different way. No. You're 180 degrees out of phase, bro. You think? Yeah, totally. Dick presents a different Dick to everybody. Okay. It's a different thing. I understand what you're saying. So you meet Dick. What was he? 
here. This is from what you sent me, okay. and I, at the time you had been working for the post office, a job you got a check for, but never showed up. Right. How would, how was that done? That would have been the agency. So you're saying that he worked for the agency? As a contract employee, as do most people who work for the agency. Most people who work for the agency don't work directly for the government. They're not a GS-14, and they don't get a check from the United States Treasury. They work under contract. <clears throat> Plausible deniability. Okay. At least we back in those days. Okay. Not only CIA, other nations as well. I know he's worked for Venezuelans, I know he's worked for some African potentates, I, I know he's worked for himself, I know he's worked for the agency. He would fly over to Thailand, mostly, and Costa Rica. Didn't see that on his passport. I got to Africa and I didn't even have a passport. He spent eight years flying around the world, Dubai. Saudi, South America, Australia, all over America, okay? And he would bring the hardware and software for that entity to do the wiretapping, okay? Here's the fun part. Every time he flies in, of course, we'd get together. So he's flying into Long Beach. Yeah, I'll pick you up. Nah, man, pick me up. You can come down and say hi, but I gotta go with them. Okay, so I come down. And it, I don't know if you've ever been to Long Beach Airport. It's like 1950. Yeah. You, you walk down the stairs, you know, out on the tarmac, right? Okay. Yeah. So th it's, it's like Casablanca or some <laughs> weird thing going on here, right? <laughs> it just wasn't night and foggy. He gets down the plane, and there's a couple guys that are just so obviously FBI or Secret Service or, you know, the black suit, white shirt, little right. black narrow tie. Remember now, this is, you know, not that long ago. And they grab him up and put him in a SUV, a, a Chevy Suburban, and oh, or Yukon or whatever it was, black, <laughs> and off they go, right? How he got the drugs in. <clears throat> Innovative thinking. Okay. At that time, if an airplane deviated coming up from South America, deviated from its flight, pl flight plan, right. the least bit, or dropped below an altitude, they would scramble jets out of Homestead Air Force Base. Okay, because there's little air, uh, airfields, landing, not airfields, but landing ships. I mean, they land on the levees, like the C-25 levee and stuff, okay? Sure. Well, but he could jump. He could do Halo. You know what Halo is? Yeah, high altitude. Low altitude. Yeah. Okay. So they would fly, he could carry seven keys. That was his max out for the shoot he had. Okay. That's a lot of coke. Okay. You're looking at what, uh, 15 and a half pounds? It's a lot of coke, man. Yeah. Huh. Do a takeoff, set a flight plan, and fly out over the Everglades, and I got the keys to the right-of-ways and all that, and I also have this big, badass, 600 horsepower Ford 4x4, okay? and I've got a small swamp buggy. <clears throat> so, he'd go out, and this is, no, there's no GPS or anything in those days, right? And it is black. Okay, there is no ambient light. And they would not do this on full moon nights. <clears throat> and you'd hear, once in a while you'd hear the airplane. Most often you did. And you'd just be sitting there, and all of a sudden you'd hear, shoot open. But that, that's innovative there, buddy. And that's how he got away with it for so long. There was no way to tell. No way to tell. None. He did, he did stuff for the government, he did stuff for himself. But it was the same stuff. At the time he got busted because he was doing a job. Okay. And he had a, a, just a couple pounds, probably a key of coke in the freezer. No, I, I'm government, not shocked. Government, no, no, government interference. He goes to court. He gets 15 years. He goes to court again. It's seven years. I might be off a year or two on the note dates. Okay. Yeah. Third time he goes, he gets six months work release. Judge! 
this is Colonel so-and-so. <laughs> you know, come on, man. You don't go from 15 years to work release on the same charge after you've been convicted. That's not happening. <clears throat> if that's not obvious government involvement, I don't know what is. Right. And that's, at the time, Norman told, told them that the, he Dick was working for him. Okay? Which Dick wasn't working for Norm. He, oh, he ended up back at the post office after that, by the way. He never spoke to you about special forces or Thailand. He did. Yeah, he told me he was there. But then he never gave specifics because he's not supposed to. Okay? okay? He did say things like, Hey, you know how they're saying we're over there training people? Yeah. Bullshit. He worked with the, um, how do you pronounce it, the Hmong? Oh, the Hmong, okay. okay. H-M-O-N-G. Uh-huh, yeah. Right. He was working with them in uh, Thailand and a little bit in Cambodia. In Special Forces <clears throat> Thailand, and I interviewed the guy on the phone, and he said, no, nah, the only thing we did in Special Forces was we trained the Royal Thai Police. That was all we did. Yeah, and, and Nixon I, didn't bomb outside of uh, South Vietnam, right? Come on, I, man. I knew, <laughs> you know, but I think this guy is still connected, and that's why he couldn't talk. Even if he's not talk. connected, he shouldn't say a damn thing. Yeah, but okay, he signed a contract saying that he would agree to say this and not say that, and that's what he has to live by. Okay, and and what Dick does to everybody is he was doing it. He tests everybody. You know what Dick was almost like? You know the Mad, Mag Mad Magazine Spy vs. Spy? Sure. And they're always... Yeah. That's Dick. Uh, when he'd leave his house, he'd do little telltales on the doors. Uh, he, he, when he parked his car. I mean, it was, like he was, it was like he was on a mission. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365. Nobody can live like that. We're sitting on the boat one night, and he's like, God damn it, Dad. God damn it. God damn it. What's my name, He says, I'm the barge. I'm just short. And that was part of his, like I told you, it was it? He was frustrated in life because he was who he was. He was the guy that could be a war hero. He I, saw himself as a big guy. And he was. He was a small stature. And, uh, and, and here's the sad part, and this is what used to tear me up, man. We'd be sitting out on the boat. He liked being out on the boat off the intercoastal out in the bay yeah. a little bit because he felt comparatively safe. He'd make me kill all the lights except for a couple running lights, which you have to have. Okay, otherwise you get run over. Yeah. And he could see anybody coming up on him from any direction. Right. We're 11 miles offshore, off of Turkey Point usually. And uh, it's a new power plant down there. That's when he would break down and start telling me things. And, and, and again, I, I keep using the same word, frustrated. Here's a guy that could talk to you on any subject or issue you could imagine. He could talk to you about John Locke, Rousseau, uh, 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 Greek philosophers, uh, the religion, various religions, uh, art. Just amazing, okay? Yeah. And... and a great cook, by the way. I don't think most people know that. But Dick could really cook up some nice food. Um, and the few times I was with him when women were involved, the women seemed really happy afterwards. Okay? So he was probably pretty good in that area, too. And that's what made it so sad, because if, 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 if they'd given him some opportunity, they got a gem here. Yeah. And I think his life would have gone different direction. Not totally, Maybe. but at least veered. When he, you were with him, very heavy drinker. Dick could out drink you, me, that guy, and four other guys under the table any day of the week. Okay. Uh, he took no pleasure from it that I could see. I never saw him but a couple, three times to where you would say that guy's drunk. And all, all those times was on the boat. We're just we're hitting back. In those days, it was uh, wild turkey and beers. So, I'm out in the glades. Okay, at the time, I had already worked as a groundman and had gotten the apprenticeship. And then, Lord Paranormal went on strike, so they shut everything down on the contract side. 
that's how I ended up in the bookshop and the gun shops. Okay. So that's why I would demonstrate the bus measure. And it wasn't just the bus measure. In those days, the bus measure was a bullpup with the stock that right. swiveled. Okay. It was the non parallax sight that came with it, which was a true technological advancement for the day. Now they're commonplace. But it was, this was the first. Okay. That's a big deal. And uh, so I'd put on my BDUs and we'd go out there. The time that sticks in my mind most is uh, a bunch of Venice Willen officers, majors, colonels. Uh, you'd see the general back at the off at the hotel down in Miami Beach or my, South Miami. Um, a lot of special forces guys, and I don't know if you know what was going on in Venezuela in the 70s. It was in El Salvador, but it was, it was right wing on. hunters and yeah. you know. Okay. I don't know if you know this, and I don't know if it's that way now, but during the Vietnam era, officers worked under a contract, not an enlistment per se. Right, I understand that. Okay. Yeah, and they didn't rehire him. So they, they, they renewed the point renew his contract, right? But then they come to him with these offers. Right. You know, the, the agency and the ATF. Now, he didn't expect to remain a captain. Right. He, he expected to be an officer, but not a captain, okay? And he thought he'd have, you know, a career in the military, and he'd work his way back up to whatever he could get to. And, and that was going to be his life. And, and he always wanted to, after Vietnam was wound down, wanted to do something in training for the next bunch of guys. Right. Okay, I mean, he told me that more times than I can remember. And he was really mad they didn't. Now then after that, look what the government did. When they needed him to do something that they didn't want their people to do, Hey Dick, how you doing buddy? Good buddy, how are you man? Okay, and then when it's over? <clears throat> gotcha. I'm telling you, every time we go to a bar, and, and not just bars, okay? You go to the 7-Eleven, you, you, you go to a burger stand, you go, go to a, a Denny's. It didn't matter. And you'd be sitting there, and, you, and here comes the dwarf, and you could see as he'd walk by, people go like... No, it's the 70s. Nobody was what they say today, woke. <laughs> now, to, to, I'm trying to think. No, I, I, this guy's I, a died in the wool war hero that overcame not only his stature but congressional approval. He's doing things that his government wants him to do that the government's saying aren't being done, right? And he comes home, even his own military would take a look at him and go, bullshit. I've been with Dick, and we're going to the PX, and we get up to the gate. He's got his ID, right? Get out of here. What do you mean, get out of here? Now, I'm coming unglued, right? Dick says, I'm coming unglued. Do you know who this is? This is a captain in the Green Berets, three tours in Vietnam. Get to attention, you piece of shit. You know? And then, then somebody, usually another guy, would come out of the shack. And he go, let me see that. He looked at the ID and he looked at the dwarf and he go, you know. Now think how that would hit a guy. No, I, I got it. And he'd be in town two, three, four, five weeks, and he'd start pacing like a tiger in a cage. And he'd gather up his crap, throw it in his truck, run out in the glades, live basically off the land. Yeah. But, uh, he, he's over the house one night, over the apartment one night. He, he was telling me, he goes, I, I just, how do you stand this? It's like being in jail. The only time I've seen Dick happy, 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 okay, was in that Coral Rock house. And he'd throw those parties, those, those gourmet dinners, he'd invite people over, and, and there'd be people painting, you know, art. And, or, or there'd be musicians. Right. And, and, and he was the king of his castle. I'm convinced that it was those nights on that boat that, I don't want to say he warmed up to me. I don't know that Dick warmed up to anybody. Because there's always a big piece of Dick that is just never going to trust you. It's it, like that coral rock house again, yeah. okay? In that vegetation. He had perimeter set up. You know, which I assume is the same thing he did in Vietnam. You know, and he and he had, he'd cut little paths to 
where his perimeters were set up so you could see if anything had happened. And, and I didn't do one-tenth of the crap that Dick did. So yeah, it's a mindset, man. But I don't think Dick's ever spent, since he left Vietnam, a happy period of time in his life. Yeah. Everywhere he goes, it never stops. He's demeaned, looked at with disgust. Now, if he was some smuck, who cares? But he wasn't. Right. He's a urodite. Philosophical. Extremely intelligent. Courage out the yin yang. Tried and tested. American war hero. And he's getting treated. Everything in his life. Well, I, I, I couldn't have done it. I don't know why he didn't kill himself. Oh, he did have a huge ego. Yeah. It's, I think part of the reason he could do some of the things he even managed to do was his ego was big enough to, that in his mind, at four foot whatever, 98 pounds, being a Green Beret captain was no big deal. I don't, I don't even think he thought I'm four foot nine. I think he just thought I can do anything I want. Okay. But yet he called himself the dwarf and he put it on the pencil. Sales. And Salesmanship. Yeah. And the... Um, That's when he'd be smiling, laughing, give you the pencil. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. You know? It's just... It's just that's his persona. Neil. It, it, you know, it's what you want. For the grace of God. I don't know why I'm alive. One of my bigger fears... Okay, look. You want the honest to God's truth? Yeah. I don't have that many years left. Two, maybe. If I do five, it's a goddamn miracle. Okay. Um, I have had serious health issues over the last five years. In fact, my uh, neurosurgeon, not neurosurgeon, uh, orthopedic surgeon, and my oncologist cannot believe I'm still walking and doing the things I'm doing, well, much less doing the things I'm doing. Right. Okay. They all thought I was going to be dead you know, a few years back. I just don't need the hassle at this point. I've got to get my wife to Texas where her sister is and where her younger son is. Our older boy is, is coming with us. I, I just want enough time that I can take care of the wife. My dad's audio recording abruptly ends there. And sadly, only nine months later, Frank Sosa would lose his battle with cancer. If you're interested in seeing more of Frank Sosa's interview, the full comprehensive interview is noted in the Giant Killer book.